Now then, I said we go back to the oaths of office, and this is very interesting. This is a Privy Councillor's oath of office. You will to, this is just a segment of it, uh, which was highlighted earlier in black, and I'll read it to you. You will to your uttermost bear faith and allegiance unto the Queen's Majesty. See the point there, unto the Queen's Majesty, i.e. the Majesty of the Crown, the Majesty of the British Constitution, and will assist and defend all jurisdictions, preeminences, and authorities granted to Her Majesty, and annexed to the Crown by Acts of Parliament or otherwise, against all foreign princes, persons, prelates, states, or potentates. It's a, medie it's a medieval oath that has been kept in place and is still the current oath. And uh, I haven't actually looked since about Christmas time, but if you go through to the Privy Councillor's website and you look for their oath of office, you will find the whole text there. And um, you have to dig for it a bit, but it's there. So that's the oath. And of course, a potentate is a, a powerful city, state, or body. Um, well, how on earth can we have preeminence if suddenly we don't have preeminence? Because that's the consequence of Lisbon. And William Pitt, back in the uh, 1770s, made a, a wonderful speech uh, in the House of Lords as the Prime Ministers of the day were, although he wasn't, well, he was arguably a Prime Minister or not, but he was a, a leading man. Uh, that to say that if the Commons had passed an unjustifiable vote, it was a matter between God and their own consciences and nobody else had anything to do with it, was such a strange assertion as he had ever heard, and involved a doctrine subversive of the Constitution. What if the Commons should pass a vote abolishing this House, abolishing their own House, and surrendering to the Crown all the rights and liberties of the people? Let's think about those words, surrendering to the Crown all the rights and liberties of the people. Very important, meaning that the Crown has taken over all the rights and liberties because it has gained absolute authority over everything. So what if the Commons should pass a vote abolishing this House, abolishing their own House, and surrendering to the Crown all the rights and liberties of the people? Would it only be a matter between God and their own consciences? And would nobody else have anything to do with it? You would have to do with it. I should have to do with it. Every man in the Kingdom would have to do with it. And every man in the Kingdom would have a right to insist upon the repeal of such a treasonable vote and to bring the authors of it to condign punishment. I therefore again call upon the noble Lord to declare his opinion, unless he will lie under the imputation of being conscious to himself of the illegality of the vote, and yet being restrained by some unworthy motive from avowing it to the world. Lord Mansfield replied not. <laughs> so I think you can see that the Constitution gives supremacy uh, to the law, not to Parliament. The coronation oath is definitely a contract by which people, uh, which we must be governed. It secures the supremacy of the law over both Parliament and the Crown. Uh, to pass powers of governance to those who owe no allegiance to the Crown and thus the people is unconstitutional. Two, to, to pass power to the unaccountable, the unelected and the not removable by the electorate of the UK is also unconstitutional. Acceptance of the supremacy of EU law is a subordination of our constitution to a foreign power. One cannot say otherwise. Uh, to accept the supremacy of EU law, the Queen will, of necessity, have to renounce her coronation contract to facilitate the dismantling of our existing constitution or be put in breach of her oath. Now, if you think about the logic of that, how could the Queen accept other preeminences um, over, us, uh, over us? And indeed, a situation arose between the King of the Belgians and his coronation uh, contract, and he did indeed abdicate and have a, uh, a, a, new, a new coronation oath over Catholicism. And that was fairly recent. Um, I think it was in the late 90s. Um, but this is an important point. So you can see that principle ought to hold. But of course, what's happening with us is that all the principles are being swept under the carpet, and nobody's seeing them. Um, but they are certainly there to be found. I hope I'm digging some out for you. Bowles versus Bank of England in 1912, very important case. Um, for those of you who remember your history lessons a little bit, the budget failed uh, in 1910, and uh, Mr. Bowles was obviously a very wealthy man. He had dividends from shares of about £30,000, but the budget went down. And one clause of the Bill of Rights is no taxation without representation i.e. an enactment of Parliament. There cannot be taxation by the Crown directly. There must be an act of Parliament to justify it. 
So he said, well, your budget's failed. You can't have your dividend. And the taxman said, no, we're taking our dividend. Bad luck. So he went to court and got this judgment. The Bill of Rights still remains unrepealed. No practice or custom, however prolonged or however acquiesced in on the part of the subject, can be relied on by the Crown as justifying any infringement of its provisions. Strong words, any infringement of its provisions. And then an issue over television licenses. Uh, Mr. Congreve, who I believe was Queen's solicitor, um, very astutely realised when colour televisions were coming in and everybody had black and white televisions, that um, they thought that, that they suddenly realised there was a great opportunity to get some more tax. We'll, uh, suddenly we won't just have a television licence, it'll be a black and white licence and a colour licence. So we'd all held television licences, those that had black and white televisions, as that was the only thing that was around. Suddenly colour comes on the scene, so the Home Office suddenly announced that the television licence uh, will be turned into a black and white licence at 12 quid, and you'll have to, if you want a colour television, you'll have to pay 18 quid for your new colour television licence. And uh, Congreve went out and bought a, a television licence the day or two before they changed the system. Um, so he had a year to run um, with a television licence. Um, and he, of course, paid his £12, uh, not uh, £18, as was being demanded. Well, the Home Office, well, he uh, it got publicised in the press, and 44,000 other people went and did the same thing, uh, and good on them. <laughs> and, of course, he went to, went to court and uh, defended the situation because the Home Office sent demands to everybody and said, oh, you've got to give us your extra £6. You've got a colour, li a colour television, haven't you? And they said, no, you know, our licences last for all but a year now. Um, and, of course, it got to court, and Denning said this. There is yet another reason for holding that the demand for £6 to be unlawful. They were made contrary to the Bill of Rights. They were an attempt to levy money for the use of the Crown without the authority of Parliament, and that is quite enough to damn them. Strong stuff. Now, another feature of the Bill of Rights is parliamentary privilege, so that to make sure that MPs can't be sued for nasty things they might say about any of us uh, in the House, um, and rightly so, uh, they are under a system of privilege. And that privilege is recorded in the Bill of Rights. Uh, Marvellous. So you can imagine that when, a question, uh, when this was questioned um, as an issue, um, the Speaker, back in 93, Madam Speaker, the question of parliamentary privilege had arisen is now a well-known court case called Pepper versus Hart. Madam Speaker, the Bill of Rights will be required to be fully respected by all those appearing before the courts. So when it's a matter of parliamentary privilege, they want it fully respected. When it's a matter of the subject's liberty, um, it may be a little tougher. This privilege is confirmed in the Declaration of Bill of Rights, and it's what is known as Article 9, but uh, it's not actually known by number in the, in the documents. When Mr. Blunkett lost a, an issue of asylum seekers, um, that got in the press, uh, and uh, it was uh, taken up by the Times, and uh, Camilla Cavendish, a reporter here, asked Lord Wolfe about the issues, and uh, because the Lords, in effect, were getting close to saying that, uh, that, that the enactment couldn't apply. Uh, Lord Wolf asked, what would happen if there had been a clash between parliamentary sovereignty, which, of course, it means that we're above the law and you do what we say, and the rule of law? His sober answer was that the question ought not to be asked. Well, of course, he's right. Technically, it ought not to be asked because Parliament ought to abide by all the constraints upon uh, the constitutional restraints upon it. Um, but he said his sober answer was that the question ought not to be asked, but it must be. That were the words from Camilla Cavendish. Um, going back to Lord Hewitt, amazing how studying some of these legal things um, gets you an, an, a tremendous insight into what's going on. But how far more attractive, and this was Hewitt talking about the rules of administrative law um, rules and regulations under subordinate measures being used to undermine the rule of law itself. And his complaint was that what they were doing was setting up administrative tribunals so that, in effect, you couldn't get to the courts. It wouldn't be a matter for the people. You would go before a tribunal and the tribunal would decide the issue. And that's, of course, what's happened. And very often at the top of the tribunal, you've got the Home Office, it's, uh, you know, the minister or whoever in charge. And Hewitt recognised the problem and put it like this. But how far more attractive 
uh, to the ingenious and adventurous mind to employ the one to defeat the other and to establish a despotism uh, on the ruins of both. It is manifestly easy to point to a superficial contrast between what was done or attempted in the days of our least wise kings and what is being done or attempted today. In those days, the method was to defy Parliament, and it failed. In these days, the method is to cajole, to coerce, and to use Parliament, and it is strangely successful. The old despotism, which was defeated, offered Parliament a challenge. The new despotism, which is not yet defeated, gives Parliament an anaesthetic. The strategy is different, but the goal is the same. It is to subordinate Parliament, to evade the courts, and to render the will or the caprice of the executive unfettered and supreme. Now, now that was 1929. So you can see that he got a pretty good handle on what principles and what the change of principles could do to us.